A bloodthirsty monster is on the prowl. A man with X-ray eyes. <laughs> Gruesome gassings are terrorizing America. And how to clone General Montgomery. A new kind of war, conflict on a scale never seen before or since. This is war at its weirdest. Incredible experiments. This has got to be one of the most bizarre weapons in the history of warfare. What is even crazier is it seems to work. Mysterious mm. events. It does sound crazy, but we have eyewitnesses that claim that's what happened. Unexplained phenomena. They've never seen anything like this before. When a world goes to war with itself, things get really weird. Rebel soldiers on patrol in the Filipino countryside come across a violently mutilated body. The dead soldier has these two puncture marks. He seems as though he's been drained of all his blood. They fear the worst. Some sort of vampire is responsible for the attack. And no one knows when the bloodthirsty monster will strike again. Eighth of December, 1941. Ten hours after bombing Pearl Harbor, the Japanese Imperial Air Force launch another surprise attack. The Americans are simply shell-shocked. They're still trying to process what's happened at Pearl Harbor when the Japanese attack again, this time on the Philippines. The Philippines have been US-controlled since 1898, when Americans defeated the Spanish rulers. But following Pearl Harbor, the US Air Force bases in Asia are severely depleted, and the Americans are powerless to thwart the attack. Before long, the Japanese have overrun the entire country. The soldiers left behind are dealt with severely, and the local population aren't treated any better. The Japanese rape and mutilate the women, and Filipino soldiers are killed in cold blood. It's estimated that during the Japanese occupation, up to a million Filipinos are killed. That figure is so enormous, it gives some indication of the attitude of the Japanese towards the native population. Yet the resolve of the mostly peasant people is far from broken. With no military force to defend them, a group of around 300 peasant farmers put together a resistance group to try and repulse the Japanese. The group of rebels call themselves the Hook Balahap, meaning the nation's army against the Japanese soldiers. Within just 12 months, the Hooks are now 20,000 strong, and they're starting to give the Japanese a taste of their own medicine. The Hooks quickly gain a reputation as assassins rather than soldiers by ambushing and murdering Japanese forces at every opportunity. In July 1945, thanks largely to the effort of the Hook soldiers, the Japanese are driven from the country, but their victory is short-lived. Despite their heroics during the Second World War, their own government turns against them because the US-backed capitalist regime wants to crush the communist-leaning hooks. The US is terrified of a totalitarian regime growing under their wings. They will do anything to thwart it. But a new enemy is about to present itself to the fearless hooks. During the conflict, a group of Hook guerrillas finds itself stationed in a very remote village when they start to hear stories of a vampire-like creature called the Aswang on the rampage. The Aswang monster is a fearsome creature from Filipino folklore. It's a shape-shifting beast that lives off the blood of humans. 
It's also said to have a taste for fetuses and small children, and particularly likes eating their livers. Fearful that the Aswang might be lurking in the bushes, the Hook rebels patrol the area with caution. As they approach their camp, their worst fears are realized. This Hook patrol comes across a fellow Hook soldier lying dead on the roadside. Closer examination of the body reveals something truly terrifying. He has two puncture marks in his neck, and he's been completely drained of blood. The first thing they think is, this is the victim of an Aswang. The brutal slaying bears all the hallmarks of the Aswang. Fearing that they might be its next victims, the Hooks flee the area in terror. It looks like the vampire legend is true, because no human would do this to another human. Would they? What the Hook rebels don't realize is that the Filipino government have enlisted the help of the infamous American commander, General Edward G. Lansdale. To say that Lansdale's not a man who plays by the normal rules of combat would be an understatement. He's a former member of the OSS, and the OSS always had a very different way of doing things. The Office of Strategic Services is the predecessor to the CIA. During the war, that's where Lansdale masters his art of psychological warfare. The OSS seeks ways of gaining any advantage they can over their enemies. Their main aim is to weaken the psychological resolve of hostile countries by exploiting their fears and superstitions. The workings of the OSS reach a whole new level of weirdness when dealing with Nazi Germany. Perhaps the OSS's most bizarre plan was to turn Adolf Hitler into a woman. The thinking goes that if they can contaminate Hitler's food with enough female hormones, then he'll lose his signature moustache and he'll develop a high, squeaky voice. Obviously, if Hitler turns into a woman, this is going to have a huge psychological impact on the German people, but it's madcap. To execute the audacious plan, the OSS bribed one of Hitler's staff to lace the Führer's carrots with oestrogen pills. They selected oestrogen as their weapon of choice because of its tastelessness and the fact that it would be undetectable to Hitler's large army of tasters. Unsurprisingly, the outrageous scheme never reaches fruition. There's this story that goes around that says that some waiter was going to put oestrogen into Hitler's food and then he chickened out at the last moment. I don't know if that's true. Turning Hitler into a woman may not have gone to plan, but the psychological warfare operations of the US continue to grow. After the war, when Lansdale is assigned to the Philippines, he uses what he learns at the OSS to take PSYOP's tactics up a notch. The first thing that Lansdale does when he arrives in the Philippines is to start studying local folklore, local legends, and when he hears about the Aswang vampire, that's when he realizes he's onto something. This is something he could use. As part of his elaborate plan to exploit this fear of the Aswang, Lansdale goes on the hunt for a victim. Lansdale orders his commandos to ambush and to kill a Hook soldier. He pricks the side of the body's neck with two metallic spikes, hangs it upside down, and lets the body drain completely of blood. This is just one gruesome act after another. The lengths that Lansdale is willing to go to are quite outrageous. Once the grisly task is finished, the bloodless corpse is thrown back on the road for his comrades to discover. The Hook's ingrained fear of the Aswang vampire does the rest. It may be gruesome, but it works. Because when the Hooks see this body drained of blood, they flee for their lives. Frankly, if I was in the Hook's position, I think I'd run for my life as well. But Lansdale's sinister tactics aren't finished yet. 
As well as fabricating vampires and sucking blood out of soldiers, Lansdale's people creep into villages and paint large eyes on buildings, on walls. This tactic is known as the Eye of God, and it's there to warn the local population that if they help or assist the rebels in any way, they're being watched. Lansdale successfully brought down the hooks using his vampire tactics. After his mission completed in the Philippines, he continues to carry out psychological warfare operations for the CIA. But it will be for his role in the gruesome Aswang Vampire Project that Edward Lansdale will be remembered most. And until this day, some of the locals still live in fear of the dark, mysterious beast. Coming up, a man with superhuman eyesight. This pilot is shooting down enemy planes with ease. The question is, how is he able to see in the dark? The Luftwaffe is desperate to know the trick. The British government responds that it's carrots. Imagine a pilot with X-ray eyes. Out of the darkness comes an RAF pilot with apparently superhuman eyesight. This pilot is shooting down enemy planes with ease. The Nazis are quite simply baffled. A man who can see when there's no light. When asked to elaborate on his seemingly inexplicable night vision, the British government responds that it's carrots. Can this humble vegetable give you laser-like eyesight? Or do the British have a much more powerful trick up their sleeve? July 1940. Germany reigns supreme over the European continent. Next in their sights is the island of Britain. But to conquer the country itself, they must first conquer its skies. Before the Germans can mount a land invasion of the British Isles, they first got to knock out the RAF. On the 10th of July, the Battle of Britain begins as the RAF and Luftwaffe lock horns. The Germans quickly realize they are taking heavy losses so they decide to change their bombing strategy. The Luftwaffe suffer most of their losses during the day, so the Nazi high command decides to move its operations to the night. Nighttime battles are not the RAF's strong suit. Their planes are woefully ill-equipped for tracking down and hunting down these night fighters. But for one British pilot, the darkness doesn't seem to be much of an issue. On the 19th of November, as Luftwaffe raiders head towards the city of Birmingham, an RAF Bowfighter aircraft emerges from the charcoal skies. The Bowfighter is piloted by 23-year-old John Cunningham. He's a rookie, but he's very, very good at what he does. The question is, how is he able to see in the dark? Cunningham's incredible night vision earns him the nickname Cat's Eyes. Cats have an uncanny ability to see at night, six times better than the human ability to see in the dark. When asked to elaborate on their superstar pilot's incredible eyesight, the authorities come out with a very surprising revelation. It seems to be, according to the Ministry of Information, that he eats a lot of carrots. The startling claim makes headlines across Britain. Even though most food has to be imported and there's a great shortage and rationing, one thing that the British have loads of is carrots. The carrot story even makes its way to the German military. When the Luftwaffe commanders get wind of the source of Cunningham's seemingly miraculous nighttime vision, they too ordered their pilots to eat carrots. 
Bag after bag, the Luftwaffe pilots are forced to eat carrots. But no matter how many they consume, it doesn't seem to change anything. Cunningham must be taking something else. Throughout the war, all sides develop highly potent drugs to turn their soldiers into super beings. During the invasion of Poland and then France, many Nazi soldiers are actually given pervitin to keep them going. Today, we know it as speed. Psychotic drugs are central to the Nazi plan to turn their pilots, sailors and infantry into soldiers capable of superhuman performance. According to reports at the time, pervitin increases soldiers' self-confidence and also it lessens their sensitivity to the effects of pain, hunger and sleep deprivation. Methamphetamine is even used by the Japanese to turn their kamikaze pilots into these fearless warriors who won't shirk from killing themselves. But Cunningham's probably not using drugs. As we know, no drug could account for Cunningham's ability. So there must be another explanation for why he's such a good shot in pitch black. In reality, the British have access to something much more powerful. Their military are working round the clock to develop a weapon made famous by the Martians in War of the Worlds. The Death Ray. American inventor Nikola Tesla is also captivated by the idea. In 1934, Tesla claims that his direct energy machine can kill a million soldiers from 200 miles away. After Tesla's startling announcement, everybody starts developing their own death rays. Germany, Britain, the US, they all want to have their own machine that can do these remarkable things. Worried that the Germans are winning the race, the British launch a competition offering £1,000 for anyone who could build a death ray capable of killing a sheep from 100 yards. The reason that Britain's so desperate to make a death ray is that they're convinced that the Nazis have already got one, and if they can vaporise people, well, frankly, we need our own one to vaporise them. Nobody is able to win the competition, so the government asks the head of the radio research station, Robert Watson Watt, to have a go. With a limitless supply of government funding, what gets to work? Watt's research demonstrates that although theoretically it's possible to create a death ray, the actual amount of energy you require is far beyond anything that could be achieved at the time. The death ray might not work the way it should, but it inspires Watt to make a device that will forever change aerial warfare. Watts realises that although rays won't actually destroy a target, what they can do is be used to reflect back and detect where the target is. To back up his theory, Watt sets up an experiment where an RAF bomber plane flies between two BBC radio masts. What he discovered was that if you sent radio waves up into the sky, they would bounce off an object and could be returned to a transmitter, and they could show you exactly where that object was in the sky. So the man that was charged to create a death ray, he ends up creating this thing that's one of the great technological leaps of the Second World War. The RAF are delighted and refine Watt's radar technology until it becomes reliable enough to be used in the battle against the Luftwaffe. So the Germans think that the British must have thousands and thousands of fighters because they're always in the right place at the right time. What they don't realize is that those fighters are in the right place because of radar. And one of the first pilots to have this installed in his plane is, well, you've guessed it, John Catseyes Cunningham. The entire carrot story was a fabrication. It was clearly made up by the British government to hide the fact that the British had developed this highly secret new piece of technology. British pilots defending their country continue to use radar to devastating effect, picking out and destroying German hunter planes. By May 1941, 
1,184 German planes have been destroyed, and Hitler is forced to give up and turns his attention to Russia. There's no question that radar, both ground and in the air, was absolutely critical in turning the Blitz and ensuring that Britain didn't surrender in 1940. It really helped the British see off the Luftwaffe. And of course, even today, we're still all told by our parents to eat our carrots in order to keep our eyesight good. I wouldn't bother. Have something else instead. Have cake, it tastes better. Coming up. America is terrified. The man's secretly pumping poison gases into people's homes in the dead of night. This seems to be the stuff of horror movies. Is the gasser a lone psycho, or just a piece of a bigger puzzle? The idea that the US government was going around spraying poisonous chemicals may sound far-fetched. It actually isn't. Nineteen forty four, small town America. A prowler is on the loose. A mysterious assailant is spraying a toxic gas into the homes of ordinary people. <laughs> Who is terrorizing the nation? Despite an FBI manhunt, nobody knows who the mad gasser is, or indeed what his motives are. It's the stuff of a horror movie. Is this a crazy man? or part of a much bigger plan to destroy America. August 1944. War rages across the world with devastating loss of life. But on the American mainland, all remains peaceful. The United States stands in strong contrast to most of the other nations that were involved in the Second World War, as the country was largely unaffected by it. In fact, the only Japanese bombing on US mainland have been two attacks, one on an army base and the other on an oil field. Neither of these result in any casualties, but ordinary Americans remain convinced that a deadly attack is imminent. Paranoia grips the nation, as many people believe that the full horror of war is about to come to mainland USA. August 31st, 1944. It's nighttime in the small town of Mattoon, Illinois. Taxi driver Bert Carney returns home from a late shift to find his wife, Aileen, paralyzed in their bed. Aileen's babbling about a strange smell, and she cannot move her legs. Bert spots a small, dark figure prowling in the darkness outside their bedroom window. When he runs outside, this mysterious man vanishes. Police and neighbors search the Carney house, but they can find nothing. The next night brings more reports of an unidentified man lurking in the neighborhood. Witnesses describe the man just as Bert did. He is tall and thin, dressed in black and wearing a cloak with a tight black cap. They claim that this madman is spraying obnoxious gas into their homes and causing all sorts of horrible effects such as nausea, paralysis, bleeding from the mouth. It's the stuff of a horror movie that an act of depravity so evil as this could exist. But the lab examinations of the victims provide surprising results. It was found that there was no chemical quality to it. So it wasn't a simple blistering agent or an irritant of any kind that was doing this to these people. Whatever it is, is so super secret and so well developed that our detection systems are not capable of detecting it. The number of supposed victims is beginning to pile up and nobody knows who this man is or what his motives are. The mysterious figure is dubbed the Mad Gasser by the press. Newspapers across the state run stories about his attacks. The FBI are brought in to investigate, but even they fail to snare the crazed assailant. In the absence of any clear evidence, speculation is rife 
that this has been carried out by some crazed First World War veteran. Many soldiers returning to America after the Great War come home plagued by severe physical and psychological problems. There's very little psychological support for former soldiers at this stage. Many return from the trenches emotionally wrecked, and there's nobody to help them. Is the mad gasser a victim of the horrors of the Great War? Determined to get revenge on the country that abandoned him? There's a lingering speculation that the person responsible for this crime might have been a victim of poison gas attack during the First World War. For that possible theory, though, absolutely no evidence whatsoever existed. Still with no clue as to the mad gas's identity, another disturbing theory emerges that the people of Mattoon are guinea pigs in a secret government experiment. The idea that the US government was going around spraying poisonous chemicals into ordinary people's homes may sound far-fetched, but given what we know today, it actually isn't. As the mad gasser is wreaking havoc on Mattoon, elsewhere, US scientists are dangerously pushing the boundaries of research. During the development of the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, the US was actually injecting plutonium into unwitting subjects. If the government are capable of doing that, they're capable of spraying gas into people's homes. One victim is 53-year-old Eb Cade, who is brought to hospital after a car accident, and he is not treated for broken bones. Instead, Cade gets injected with 4.7 micrograms of plutonium so that scientists can measure the after-effects of radioactive exposure. Cade is the first unsuspecting person to be injected with plutonium, but he's not the last. Still without answers, panic around the town reaches fever pitch when people discover that the mad gasser could be an escaped Nazi prisoner. By this stage of the war in Europe, hundreds of thousands of captured German soldiers are sent as prisoners of war to Britain. Before long, the sheer number of prisoners becomes overwhelming. In order to deal with this overcrowding, Britain asked the United States to take some half a million German POWs off its hands, and the United States agrees. A prisoner of war camp in nearby Hoopston is well known to the citizens of Mattoon. Just before the gas attacks occur, three prisoners escape by digging a tunnel underneath a fence. Reports start to emerge that one of these escapees is seen around Mattoon, and this starts to send panic around the town. It led quickly to the speculation that the Mad Gasser is an escaped German prisoner of war seeking to exact revenge against the American people. But the German POWs aren't the only Nazis in America intent on terrorizing the local population. After Germany declares war on the United States, Hitler sets up a top-secret mission known as Operation Pistorius. The object is simple. It's to terrorize the American population by carrying out sabotage attacks using Nazi spies. To carry out these attacks, Nazi top brass recruit eight German agents who are already naturalized American citizens. After weeks of sabotage training, the eight spies are smuggled to the US coast in U-boats. These Nazi saboteurs are armed with all sorts of weaponry, and they're told to do whatever they can to wreak havoc on the US population. But the idea that the mad gasser could be part of Operation Pistorius has a significant flaw. One reason why the operation wasn't very successful was that the spies were quite simply not very good spies. Before their mission even begins, they prove how incompetent they are. One of them leaves some sensitive documents on a train, and another gets drunk in a bar and tells everybody that he's a spy. They were not what Hitler intended as his crack team of agents in the United States. Back in Mattoon, 
Any trace of the mad gasser has dissipated faster than his sinister gas. Through the years, speculation continues as to who the mad gasser could be. To my mind, there's absolutely no doubt that the mad gasser was simply mass hysteria and nothing else. This is the pattern. Nerves turn to paranoia, which turn to hysteria. And that, in my opinion, is exactly what happened here. No one ever figures out who the mad gasser was. It remains to this day a mystery. Coming up, a master plan to fool the Nazis. The Germans now want to keep a close eye on him. They want to know what he's up to. D-Day can only succeed if the Germans are kept in the dark. General Montgomery needs to be cloned. To win the war, the Allies need to fool the Germans. And they have a plan. Montgomery and Eisenhower have been based in Hampshire for weeks, planning the D-Day invasion of Normandy. But for the plan to work, you need two Montes. Montgomery has apparently arrived for a very important meeting in Gibraltar. So how can Monty be in two places at once? This is the story of how the Allies clone General Montgomery. June 1944. German forces reign supreme in mainland Europe. But Hitler knows that it will only be a matter of time before the Allies launch an invasion. American, British and Commonwealth troops are all gathered together in southern England in advance of the D-Day invasion of Europe. And ground forces are commanded by General Sir Bernard Montgomery. The problems the Germans have is knowing where and when the invasion will take place. After all, Hitler knows that the Allies can land in any one of dozens of places all the way along the French coast. Hitler orders Field Marshal Erwin Rommel to make defensive plans. The only way the Germans will be able to repel an invasion whenever it comes is with the help of tanks in panzer divisions. But he doesn't have enough divisions to station them all the way along the coast. So what he has to do keep them in reserve, and they get them to spring into action wherever they're needed. For this to work, the panzers need to respond quickly. They need to know as soon as the invasion fleet is sighted and to be certain where it is landing. The Allies know that D-Day can only succeed if the Germans can be kept in the dark. It's imperative that the locations come as a complete surprise. Allied commanders turn to a master of military deception to help them pull off this seemingly impossible feat. Brigadier Dudley Clark. Clark has a long and frankly very distinguished record in army intelligence. He's behind some of the first commando raids. And in Cairo, he set up a specialist team called A-Force, which is designed to mislead the Germans with a very sophisticated disinformation campaign. Clark knows that the Germans expect Montgomery to be close to the action when the invasion finally takes place. Monty, as he's known by his troops, is a, a clever general. He's a good tactician. He's very methodical. Uh, and he's really loved by his soldiers. And he's also respected by the Germans. He's, he's beaten Rommel in the Western Desert. And the Germans now want to keep a close eye on him. They want to know what he's up to. To convince the Germans that the invasion will take place far away from Normandy, Montgomery can't be seen in England in the run-up to D-Day. Dudley Clark knows that this will never happen. Monty needs to be close to the troops that he's commanding. Monty will be taking split-second decisions on D-Day, and indeed all the days and weeks after it. So he can't just sit back in southern England and wait for communications to reach him. He needs to be there on the ground, making these vital decisions. On a night out at the cinema, Clark has a sudden brainwave. He's watching a film called Five Graves to Cairo, and in this film, there's an actor called Miles Mander playing the part of Montgomery. And he's very convincing. And a light bulb goes off in Clark's head. What if we got an actor to play the part of Montgomery in real life? The deception plan is simple. 
Montgomery needs to be somewhere he isn't. But for that to work, Clark needs to clone Monty. The Allies want the Germans to think that they're at the planning stages of an invasion of southern France rather than actually about to invade Normandy. And Clark knows the perfect place for the deception, far away from where D-Day is actually being planned. Gibraltar, or the rock as it's known by the Brits, is an absolutely vital part of the British Empire because it's from there that the British can oversee and control all the shipping going in and out of the Mediterranean. Rumours are spread by British agents that Monty will be calling at Gibraltar on his way to North Africa to discuss plans for an invasion of southern France. And the British Secret Service know that there are several Spanish diplomats based in Gibraltar who are working for the Germans. Spain may be officially neutral, but General Franco, let's not forget, is a fascist, and he is secretly supplying Hitler with information about the Allies all the way throughout the war. The British know that the top German spy in Gibraltar is Major Ignacio Molina Perez. He's the liaison officer between the Spanish government and British authorities. Clark knows that if a phony Monty makes a convincing appearance in Gibraltar, Molina and the Germans will soon know about it. The hunt begins for Monty's doppelganger. The deception operation is given the code name Copperhead. Obviously, the first port of call is Miles Mander. He's the actor who's already played Montgomery in a film. But Miles Mander, it turns out, lives in Hollywood, and also he's actually quite a lot taller than Montgomery. If they're going to persevere with this, they're going to have to look elsewhere. But then one of Clark's team comes across an Australian actor called Merrick Clifton James, who's in a kind of variety show playing the part of Monty. He looks the absolute spitting image. Convincing an actor to play a role this important is not going to be easy. The course of the war will swing on his performance. There's a lot at stake. To persuade James to take on the role of his life, Clark enlists the help of popular British actor David Niven. Niven is a veteran of the Army Film Unit and very experienced. He's also known to be immensely charming. If Niven can't convince him, no one can. Niven contacts James and asks him to come to London on the pretext of making a new film. He must have thought he'd won the lottery. A call from an A-lister and a chance to make it in the big time. When James arrives in London, Niven sits him down and reveals that he hasn't been entirely truthful. Someone from MI5 steps into the room to reveal that James has been chosen to act as a double for Montgomery. And he must keep his role top secret. To convince the Germans that he is the real Montgomery, James must learn the general's mannerisms and way of speaking. He is attached to Montgomery's staff in the guise of a journalist. Monty always had a press corps around him. So for James to be a member of that press pack following Monty, he would attract no attention whatsoever. It's a good way for him to look at Monty to see how Monty behaves. The problem with mimicking Montgomery would be his mannerisms, his very, very unusual voice. As in the past, its efficiency will depend largely on the public spirit of the best of our citizens. And his incredible arrogance and confidence, which I think even for an actor would be difficult to pull off. On the eve of his mission, James is given a pep talk by Monty himself. It was stress to James how important his role was. It was stress that the success of D-Day depended on his performance. So if he wasn't nervous before, he was certainly nervous now. The pressure was really on. On the 26th of May, 1944, James and his handlers board Churchill's personal plane to fly to Gibraltar. As the plane takes off, James leaves his old identity behind. He now lives and breathes Montgomery. Every detail has been thought of. James's hair has been dyed to exactly match Monty's. He wears a carbon copy of Monty's uniform and is even carrying handkerchiefs monogrammed with Monty's initials. Everything is ready for James to make his debut. But then the plan looks as though it's going to fall apart just at the final moment.
James has smuggled a hip flask of alcohol on board. He's swigging from it because he's nervous, understandably, but he's drunk, so the plane has to circle around while he sobers up. When he eventually lands, James is greeted by the Governor-General, who's been briefed on the deception. Montgomery and Governor-General uh, Ralph Eastwood were old friends, so as soon as they meet, James has to start putting on a performance. The party then heads off in cars for dinner at Government House. And a special guest has been invited to meet the fake Monty. Liaison officer, Molina Perez. What Clark and the Secret Service do is ensure that Perez is sat close to Montgomery, close enough to convince him that that is the real thing. With Molina Perez in earshot, James plays his best Monty act. Molina apparently questions a secretary about Monty's visit. Now, this secretary is in with the hoax, and she confirms that Monty is on his way to North Africa. Perez gets very, very excited. He starts asking questions, and then he excuses himself. He goes to make a telephone call, and the telephone call is indeed straight to his handlers. With dinner over, Monty's double heads back to the airfield. When Molina Perez leaves Government House, he is tailed by Secret Service agents. Intelligence documents revealed a message was sent by Perez from Madrid to Berlin within 20 minutes of that meeting saying that Montgomery was on his way to North Africa. This is exactly what the British intend. While the real Monty is busy planning D-Day in England, James keeps up the charade by flying to Algiers in North Africa. He reviewed troops, he met generals, he put in the performance of a lifetime. And then he was taken to Cairo, where he lay low. Just a few days later, on the 6th of June, 1944, the Allies invade the French coast of Normandy. The Germans are caught completely by surprise. Rommel himself is back home on leave, visiting his wife for her birthday. The panzer divisions available to the Nazis were held back because Nazi high command were convinced that a Normandy invasion was a diversion and the real attack was coming somewhere else. The Germans have been fooled and the tide of the war has turned against Hitler. For James, it's back to the day job. He returns to the Army Pay Corps after his five-week adventure, still sworn to secrecy. Despite pulling off, frankly, what is one of the greatest performances ever, James never hits the big time. He eventually stars in a film called I Was Monty's Double, with James himself playing both James and Monty. It's pretty confusing, but that's about the limit of his career. Still, James remains the only actor in history who can claim he's the cloned version of General Montgomery. And that's possibly a far greater achievement than any Oscar-winning performance. <laughs>